Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss the psychiatric disorder, bipolar disorder. So, let me give you an outline then for the structure of this video. We're going to start by going over the basics of what bipolar disorder is and what people suffering from bipolar disorder will actually go through. What we'll then move on to discussing is something quite controversial. We'll discuss the pathophysiology, or what is believed to be the pathophysiology that underlies bipolar disorder. Now, as with all the psychiatric disorders, the pathophysiology underlying bipolar disorder is not fully understood and remains very controversial. However, there is a major theory uh, known as the monoamine hypothesis of mood disorders that is probably the leading textbook theory of what may be occurring in bipolar disorder. So we will study that theory, uh, but be aware the spirit with which we're doing it, that it may well be complete rubbish, uh, but it's our best current theory. Uh, so we will study the monoamine hypothesis of mood disorders. After we've done that, we will have a look at the drugs that are currently used to treat bipolar disorder and uh, in view of our belief in the monoamine hypothesis, we'll try to get a little bit of understanding uh, about how these drugs might work. So, um, let's begin then with the uncontroversial bit, which is, what is bipolar disorder? So, let's begin with a little bit of classification. So, there are loads of different psychiatric disorders, and humans absolutely love to classify things. And psychiatrists are no different. They love to classify the psychiatric disorders into different classes. So some of the major classes which we put psychiatric disorders into are the anxiety disorders, the mood disorders, and the psychotic disorders. There are other classes of psychiatric disorders, but those are the big three classes of psychiatric disorders. And bipolar disorder fits into the class of mood disorders. So let me just write this down here. So bipolar disorder, it is an example of a mood disorder. And as the name suggests, mood disorders are disorders of mood. They are a problem with your mood and also your energy level. But fundamentally, the major thing that goes wrong in mood disorders is a problem with your mood. So, bipolar disorder is one of the major examples of a mood disorder. The second major example of a mood disorder is, of course, depression. There are other types of mood disorders other than depression and bipolar disorder, but these two are the two biggies. So, depression is another example of a mood disorder. Now, even though the video is on bipolar disorder, it is necessary for us to discuss depression as well because these two are very much so related but also very different. And to understand bipolar disorder properly, I think it's important to compare it to depression and also to contrast it to depression. Show what is the same usually as in depression and then show how bipolar disorder is different. So even though the video is about bipolar disorder, we will be studying a lot about depression. And indeed, bipolar disorder, you can also hear it called bipolar depression. So another name for bipolar disorder is to call it bipolar depression. And indeed, a third name that you might still hear used for bipolar disorder is to call it manic depression. Manic depression is the old name for bipolar disorder, which is kind of being phased out now in favour of the name bipolar disorder. However, it's not a horrendous name. It is quite a good name, and you'll see later once I've given you the description of what happens usually in bipolar disorder, why I'm saying manic depression is not actually a bad name for this disorder. It's quite a good name. However, it's the name that's now been phased out. You will still hear, however, people referring to manic depression, both clinicians and patients referring to um, bipolar disorder as manic depression. So be aware of those three names for the same thing, bipolar disorder, bipolar depression, and manic depression. Now, um, we can extend the name depression to contrast it to bipolar disorder. If you wish, you can call depression unipolar depression to absolutely exaggerate the fact that it is different to bipolar mood disorders. This is a unipolar mood disorder. And if you don't know what that means, I'll explain in a moment. It will all become apparent. 
So, let's now begin our discussion then. So we're going to actually start by discussing what happens to someone who is suffering from unipolar depression, and then we'll see what happens to someone who is suffering from bipolar disorder. So, what happens to someone who is suffering from unipolar depression? So let's say we have a man who is suffering from unipolar depression. What is this man actually going to experience? Well, the thing that you get with unipolar depression is what we call depressive episodes. So our gentleman with unipolar depression is going to suffer from things called depressive episodes. And these are long periods of time where both mood and energy levels are low. So I'll just write this down. So we have fancy words uh, for low mood and low energy. So the word for low mood, being in a bad mood, feeling sad, that kind of thing, low mood, is dysphoria. So dys means something wrong with, phoria means mood. So this means that uh, there's something wrong with your mood, uh, your low mood. So a depressive episode is a period of dysphoria. But in addition, and very, very importantly to remember when we're trying to understand the major difference between bipolar disorder and unipolar depression, is also, it's not just low mood, it's also low energy. And the word for low energy is anergia, or the fancy word for it anyway. An means no, ergia means pertaining to energy levels. So, um, in a depressive episode, you will have a long period of time where both your mood and your energy level is low. So mood, we all know what mood means, that's how happy you are, uh, how content you are with life. So you're going to be continuously uncontent and sad and potentially angry and irritable as well. Um, whereas energia, it means, you know, it's about energy levels. And energy levels is how much, well, energy that you have, how much you want to get out of bed in the morning and go out and do things. If you've got very low energy level, this means that you might no longer want to go out and do things. Instead, you might want to just remain in your home, uh, maybe remain in bed or lie around on the sofa watching television, but you don't want to do that much anymore. So, in a depressive episode, then, you have this period of time where your mood is low and also your energy level is low. Now, how long does this usually go on for? Now, this is important. If you are suffering from a little period of low mood and low energy that lasts maybe a few days, that is not counted as a depressive episode. To be called a depressive episode, it needs to have lasted for at least two weeks. So a depressive episode, this lasts from, for a few weeks, but it can go on for much longer than that. So it can go on for months and even to years. Um, so I'll put that it's going to be greater than or equal to a few weeks. But, you know, to count as a depressive episode, it has to be greater than or equal to at least two weeks, two weeks at the minimum. So depressive episodes, they generally last for greater than or equal to a few weeks. Well, by definition, they last uh, for greater than or equal to a few weeks. Um, but they can go on indefinitely for months to years. And there are these periods of low mood and low energy. Now, let me just draw you a little graph that is reasonably helpful when we're talking about uh, mood disorders. So, when you are suffering from a depressive episode, your mood and your energy level are continuously down. Now, this is not any more congruent to life events. So, in someone who does not have a mood disorder, of course, your mood and your energy levels, they fluctuate all the time. So, I can draw a little sort of tongue-in-cheek graph here if I get the pen. Um, so let me just draw this here. So here's the y-axis, here is the x-axis. Let's put time along the x-axis here, and then as I say, here comes the tongue-in-cheek bit. On the y-axis, we can either put mood or we can put energy. The graph that I would draw for both of these is exactly the same, so I'll put mood slash energy. So I'm showing two graphs in one here, effectively. Okay. So we're either talking about mood or we're talking about energy, but the picture I would want to draw is exactly the same. So instead of drawing two pictures, I'm just going to combine it into one. So in a normal person, what actually happens? Well, your mood and your energy, they fluctuate on a, you know, daily basis. And it's congruent to what's actually happening to you in your life. 
So you know, if someone gives you a free ice cream, your mood goes up. If you get fired or you fail an exam, your mood goes down for a while. So in people who don't have mood disorders, this is perfectly healthy um, biology here, that mood and energy level do fluctuate, and it's incongruence, it's in fitting, it's in keeping with what's actually happening to you in your life. Uh, so, like so. So, here it goes, fluctuating around. It, the roller coaster of life, as they call it. So, mood and energy are continuously going up and down, bobbing up and down, and it's congruent with what is actually happening in your life. In a depressive episode, your mood and your energy level go completely down for a long period of time, and this is no longer caused by life events. It's not that it's down continuously because something terrible keeps happening. It's down because there is something majorly wrong with the way that the brain controls your mood and your energy level. And later on, we will, of course, study the monoamine hypothesis of mood disorders, which tries to explain what the neurobiological correlate of mood and energy actually is. So, drawing then on uh, the line for when you're in a depressive episode, it might look like this. I mean, it's still going to fluctuate a little bit, um, but you can see that the line is permanently down. It's still fluctuating because things are still happening to you and your mood does still react a little bit, uh, but not, nothing can actually bring it back up to this level. Even if good things happen to you, if someone gives you a free ice cream, it doesn't make you happy in the way that it previously did. Let's say this is someone giving some, you a free ice cream. Usually it will bring your mood right up here and you'd feel great. Um, whereas if the equivalent thing happens to someone in a depressive episode, that isn't going to be good enough to bring their mood back up anymore. So the low mood and the low energy, it's no longer in keeping with what is actually happening to you. It's something majorly wrong with the brain. The way that the brain handles mood and energy levels has broken for somehow. Um, and no longer can life events bring your mood back up. So that's what's going to happen to someone who's suffering from unipolar depression. Remember, this graph is both mood and energy. So you can either say that this graph is for mood over time or it could be for energy over time so it's important to remember that in a depressive episode it is not just mood that is down it is also your energy that is down so people suffering from a depressive episode they generally want to do very little they're very very sad and that's because the energy level is low so they don't want to do anything and their mood level is low which is why they're um, very sad with this now, of course, depressive episodes hopefully do not last forever, uh, and eventually uh, you'll come out of the depressive episode and then your mood will return to being this line temporarily until you then suffer from another depressive episode. So in unipolar depression, you uh, have depressive episodes followed by an episode potentially of normal mood, and then you can go into another depressive episode, and so on. Okay, so that's what happens in unipolar depression. Let's now talk about bipolar disorder, the one that we're really interested in. So in bipolar disorder, the reason it's called bipolar disorder is that you can have two different types of episodes in bipolar disorder. In unipolar depression, it was only one type of episode. You went in one direction. You had depressive episodes. Whereas in bipolar disorder, you can have two different types of episodes. You can go in two different directions. So people with bipolar disorder, it's a more... Um, it's a bigger mood disorder in a way because you can suffer from both depressive episodes but you can also suffer from episodes called manic episodes and let's now talk through what is a manic episode. So this is the additional type of episode that you can suffer if, with if you have bipolar disorder but which is not something that happens in unipolar depression. So manic episodes, so these are where you go up rather than down. Now, there's an important thing here to point out that people often get confused with because the archetypal manic episode is actually quite rare. So I'm going to divide manic episodes into two different types of manic episodes. Let me put this down here. So the first type of manic episode is what I will call a euphoric manic episode. 
And this is the one that everyone sort of archetypally thinks of, the stereotype of what happens to people who are suffering from bipolar disorder. However, this stereotype of a manic episode is not actually that common. I've only met one person in my time of doing psychiatry as a medical student who actually suffered from euphoric manic episodes. More commonly, the people with bipolar disorder suffered from what I will call depressive manic episodes. And this is why I think that the name manic depression for bipolar disorder was a very good name for describing what more normally happens to people when they're in a manic episode. So let me now explain what I mean when I say a euphoric manic episode and a depressive manic episode. So let's start with euphoric manic... Actually, no, let's not start with euphoric manic episode. Let's start with depressive manic episode because this is the more common one in my experience. Most people with bipolar disorder, they suffer from depressive episodes and then they have what we call depressive manic episodes. So in depressive manic episodes... Your mood is still low. You do not feel happy. People suffering from these depressive manic episodes do not feel happy. So that's something that is in common with depressive episodes. Dysphoria remains there. The major difference here and what mania is all about is that your energy level goes through the roof. So in a manic episode or a depressive manic episode, the one that we're talking about at the moment, your mood remains low, you are not happy, you are not content, you are irritated, agitated, anxious, you know, your mood is not good, but your energy level does not go down, your energy level goes through the roof, so it's the opposite graph to this one here, your mood does this, goes down, but your energy level is going to go up like so, so I'll put it up here in red. So your energy level goes up and then it stays up throughout the episode. And again, this is not congruent with the normal activities of life. Normally, we know that energy level goes up and down and up and down in a congruent way to what is actually happening in your life. In this type of manic depressive episode, um, your energy level is going to go up and just stay up. It will fluctuate a bit, as I've tried to show on this picture, but overall... It stays up even if bad things happen to you that should bring your energy level down. Uh, it stays up. So, let me put that here. So, your energy level goes through the roof in depressive manic episodes. And that is the major difference between a depressive episode and a depressive manic episode. You still remain unhappy, but your energy goes through the roof. So I've met several people who have been suffering from depressive manic episodes and they're not happy, they're, they're miserable, um, but they're incredibly energetic. Um, they describe, you know, staying up all night, uh, doing things um, because they've got so much energy. So they have much reduced need for sleep compared to uh, people who are not suffering from a depressive manic episode. And this is because the energy has gone through the roof. As I say, we will come on to the euphoric manic episode, which is the classical manic episode, but I have only met one person in my entire time of doing psychiatry who actually suffered from a euphoric manic episode. Um, so it's, in my experience, less common to actually see people um, with euphoric mania. And of course, that's where the energy doesn't just go up, but also your mood goes up through the roof. So in a way, that's the nicer one to have. You're happier in that episode. Um, but it is a rarer type of uh, manic episode. Um, so there are more symptoms that I want to talk about of a depressive manic episode before we go on to euphoric manic episode. Because it's not just that you have low mood and your energy goes through the roof. There's also a bunch of symptoms which I will group under this strange word that you might not have heard before, which is volition. So one of the major things that happens in a manic episode, both euphoric manic episodes and depressive manic episodes, is that your volition goes up. So let me explain what I actually mean by this word volition. So this is a concept that's actually very important when you're discussing the psychotic disorders. Volition is a fancy word for willpower, okay, so I'll write that down, I'll get another colour, because I'm a little bit fed up of this um, orange colour, 
So volition is really a fancy word for willpower, and I want you to understand the difference between me saying that energy goes up and willpower goes up. Because you might think, aren't those kind of the same thing? Isn't energy very much so to do with your willpower? Well, they are subtly different things, what I mean by energy going up and volition going up. Energy going up is all about how much you want to do, how much you are excited for and your plans for going and doing things that day. When you wake up and you decide what you want to do, how adventurous are you feeling? How um, ambitious are you feeling with, for the day's activities? That's what I mean by energy, how much you want to do. Whereas by volition going up, I mean how easy it actually is for you to do things. Now, this is a complicated concept, so let me spend some time uh, with this. So, I think probably the best way to do this is to describe it in terms of things that you were probably aware of from common sense. So, when you... Remember back to the last time you were very ill. Remember back to the last time you had flu or something like that, and you all you wanted to do was stay in bed. So your energy level had gone down when you had flu because you didn't want to do anything. But can you remember also that it was a great effort to do anything when you had flu? If you actually tried to force yourself to do things, it was much, much more difficult. You know, just moving your body was difficult. Uh, if you were really, really ill, it was a great effort to maybe go and walk to the shops and buy stuff. That was a huge effort. It was much, much more difficult to do things. Also, if you tried to sort of like, I don't know, deliver a public speech when you were ill, you would find it far more difficult. Finding words, finding speech, creating speech and talking to people when you are ill is far more difficult. The brain functioning is far more difficult. Doing things is actually far more difficult when you are ill. This concept of how easy it is to do things, that is what I mean by volition. Energy is about motivation, about how much you want to do. Volition, by what I mean by volition, is how easy it actually is for the brain to do things. Now, let me explain this a little bit more. Let me just draw a little picture of the brain. So I'm just drawing a classic little picture of the brain here. So this is a picture I'm sure you've seen before. It's just a picture of the brain from the left-hand side. So there's the left cerebral hemisphere. And of course, we have the brain stem peeking out underneath there. And then... Uh, the cerebellum behind. So I've just drawn this because I need something to point at. So the concept of volition really is all about promoting thoughts. So I'll write this down. So volition is all about promoting thoughts. Now what do I mean by promoting thoughts? So when you want to do something, when you want to make a movement, or when you want to uh, talk to someone, when you want to create speech, all of this requires thoughts in the brain. And when you actually want to do a thought, that thought needs to grow. It needs to be promoted. It needs to go in a very crude way. And this is what I'm about to draw, a very crude representation of what this is about. What needs to happen is you need to have a thought that's very small. So here, that little circle there is representing a thought that's very small. A small portion of the brain is processing that thought. And you then need to turn it into a bigger thought. So that new circle is now a thought that's being processed by a larger portion of brain. So this is what I mean when I say promoting up thoughts. I mean taking a thought that's very small and is only being processed by a tiny portion of the brain and promoting it up so that it's now being thought, you know, or um, processed by a much larger portion of the brain. And this is really what volition is all about. There is a system inside the brain that is extremely important for this, that is important for promoting thoughts, deciding which thoughts are going to become bigger, which thoughts are going to be promoted up, and which are not. And this system is extremely important whenever we want to do something. Whenever you want to make a movement, that thought needs to grow. It needs to be promoted up. The thought of making that movement and the motor plan, you know, the exact combination of action potentials that need to go down to the muscles to make them contract in the correct way, all of that needs to be promoted up. This is what volition is all about. How easy 
the brain binds it to promote our thoughts. And if the brain has very high volition, then it will promote our thoughts with huge ease, and therefore you will find it very easy to make movements. You'll find it very easy to talk and deliver speeches, um, because uh, that's what you need to be able to do in order to actually do things. You need to be able to promote our thoughts. This is what I mean by volition, how easy the brain is finding it to promote up thoughts, how readily the brain promotes up thoughts, and of course promoting thoughts is essential for being able to move easily and being able to um, talk easily and do other things. So, when you are very ill, your volition is reduced, your brain finds it far more difficult uh, to promote up thoughts, and therefore you have to put much more energy into doing anything, much more energy into concentrating on talking to someone, or uh, actually making your way down the streets to the shops. And indeed, this is something that goes majorly wrong in the disease Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, volition breaks, specifically volition initially for the motor system, and you lose the ability to uh, promote up thoughts with regards to motor actions. And therefore, it becomes hugely difficult for people with Parkinson's disease to actually initiate voluntary movements. Okay, so in someone with a depressive manic episode, they're going to have low mood, they're going to have high energy, and they're also accompanying the high energy, they're going to have high volition. So their brain is going to promote up thoughts at a ridiculously easy level. And this gives a huge number of symptoms that I now want to talk through, which are all under this category of increased volition. You can also describe these uh, symptoms that I'm now about to put down under the heading psychomotor agitation. So this refers to psychological and the motor system agitation, which means basically uh, being able to think and speak and move very, very easily and doing it too much because you can do it so easily. Okay, um, so let me go through some of these symptoms. So People with depressive manic episodes then, or manic episodes full stop, they often describe something called racing thoughts. And this is where they feel as though they're thinking far quicker than other people, and indeed they are thinking far quicker than other people. So they think their thoughts come much more quicker than other people. And you'll probably remember the last time you were ill, do you remember feeling how sluggish your thoughts were, how slow your thoughts were? Again, that was because your volition was reduced. The ease with which you were promoting up thoughts, taking a thought from being a small thought to being a large thought was incredibly slow, incredibly difficult, and therefore the speed of your conscious thoughts was very, very slow. In bipolar disorder, the manic episodes of bipolar disorder, volition goes through the roof, and therefore you end up with really quick thoughts, and the fancy terminology for that is racing thoughts. Okay, um... With the racing thoughts, they also end up speaking really quickly, and we describe that as pressured speech. So pressured speech means talking extremely fast. And again, this is because their volition is extremely high. If your volition is extremely high, then you can talk extremely easily, and you will end up talking extremely fast, along with the racing thoughts. So this is all because they are finding it far too easy to promote thoughts from being processed by a small portion of the brain to being processed by a larger portion of the brain. So they're finding uh, talking, e uh, talking very, very easy and they talk extremely fast. Okay, um, so pressured speech is another symptom of raised volition. Next, another symptom that can occur, this doesn't necessarily occur in everyone who is suffering from a manic episode, is something that we call flight of ideas. And this is where you jump from idea to idea to idea extremely quickly. Now, this doesn't necessarily happen in everyone who suffers from a manic episode. However, it is one of the common things that can occur. Um, and this is, again, in tune with what we've just been talking about. With the racing thoughts, thinking extremely quickly, and with the pressured speech, talking extremely quickly, you can end up jumping from idea to idea to idea extremely quickly. So when you're talking to someone who is suffering from a manic episode, 
they're, what they're saying can end up not making that much sense because they are jumping from one idea to another idea very quickly. Um, so you can think, well, how have they got there? Why have they stopped talking about this other thing and now moved on to that? And again, it's because their brain is moving on incredibly quickly. Um, because their volition is so high, they promote up thoughts extremely easily and therefore they end up jumping from one thought to another very quickly. And we call that flight of ideas. So it can be quite difficult following uh, the conversation when you're talking to someone who's suffering from a manic episode because they will end up jumping from one idea to something completely different very quickly. Um, and then you'll have to get them back to talking about the initial thing that you were talking about. So flight of ideas is another symptom of psychomotor agitation, the increased volition. So more, there are two more that I want to add onto this list. Another symptom is what we call disinhibition. And this means that their behavior changes. They do things that they would not have done previously when they were not in a manic episode. They do things that previously would have been inhibited. So for instance, people with manic episodes, they can end up going on spending sprees, they can end up going and spending a huge amount of money, and this is again because there isn't that block of doing these things. Previously, when your volition was at a normal level, this is what stopped you from going out and spending huge amounts of money that you do not have using your credit card, um, that the thought to do that was being blocked and not being promoted up. So there is a very important important part of the brain responsible for volition and deciding which thoughts should be promoted up and which should not. And when your volition is far too high, it allows loads of thoughts to be promoted up that would not have been promoted up previously, that would have been blocked previously. And this is how you can end up doing things uh, that you would not have previously done. So you can end up going on spending sprees. So I'll put some of these examples here. Let's get another cover getting fed up with this grey, bluey colour. So, whoops, um, examples of disinhibition, you can go on spending sprees, so spending lots of money. Uh, they can also end up having sex with a huge number of people that they wouldn't have previously had sex with, and that's called hypersexuality. And it's all because of the increased volition. This makes it far more easy for them to do things, basically. Things that would have previously been inhibited and not been promoted up. Ideas and motivations and thoughts to do things that wouldn't have previously been blocked and would have been inhibited, such as, I want to go to this shop and spend a huge amount of money. That thought, that would have previously been inhibited. It wouldn't have been promoted up. And the thought of, oh, I would like to have sex with that person, that would have previously been uh, inhibited. But now, it's being promoted up and therefore their behaviour changes in this way. So disinhibition is also believed to stem from the increased volition, the increased ease of doing things, the lack of that sort of block of, oh, I don't, I mustn't do that and I wouldn't, can't do that. That's gone now because thoughts come so easily. Okay, so disinhibition is also uh, a major symptom of the increased volition, and then finally, in this list, uh, they can develop psychotic symptoms. So these are the symptoms of the psychotic disorders, and the major example of a psychotic disorder is, of course, schizophrenia. So what are the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia? Well, these are things like hallucinations and delusional thoughts. So the two major types of psychotic symptoms are hallucinations, and this is where you perceive something that is not actually there. You perceive a sensory stimulus that is not actually there. And therefore, we can split hallucinations into different categories. Um, there are visual hallucinations, which is where you perceive a visual stimulus that is not actually present. So you can see things that are not there. There are auditory hallucinations, which are probably the major type of hallucinations experienced by people with schizophrenia. And that's where you hear voices that aren't there, or you hear sounds, but usually voices that aren't actually present. And you hear these as though they are real. They're as real to you as, you know, a person talking to you or something really being there. Uh, these are major, major problems. Um, 
hallucinations. And you can also have somatosensory hallucinations, and this is where you feel things uh, that aren't actually there. So people can describe feeling as though there are insects crawling inside of them, and that's a somatosensory hallucination. Other uh, class of psychotic symptoms is what we call delusions, and these are thoughts. These are ridiculous thoughts, ridiculous beliefs that cannot actually be true and which cannot be explained by someone's religious and cultural background. So, of course, some people would argue that belief in a god is a delusion. However, by definition, belief in god is not a delusion because that's in keeping with your religious and cultural background. Um, delusions are these bizarre beliefs that are evidently false and which cannot be justified by your religious and cultural background. So, for instance, people can end up believing that they've been abducted by aliens, things like that. Uh, that would be uh, classed as a delusion. So we often split delusions into different categories. Uh, so some of the major examples, in bipolar disorder, people can end up getting delusions of grandeur. This is one of the major types of delusion uh, that people with bipolar disorder get. Um, and this is where you believe that you are more than you actually are. So people can end up believing that they are a god or a deity of some sort. So maybe Jesus or something along those lines or a prophet. Uh, people believe that they are something far more than they are. Um, so that's what we call a delusion of grandeur. Other major types of delusions, just to have a full picture, uh, there are also delusions of persecution. And these are where you believe that other people are trying to harm you, even though uh, they're not. Uh, so people can end up believing that their neighbours are spying on them, or that the secret services are spying on them, that their entire flat is rigged with tiny microphones and cameras watching them, or that they're in the Truman Show. That's a major example of a delusion of persecution. People believing that they are in the Truman Show, that their entire life is fake, and that there's cameras everywhere watching them. Those are all delusions of persecution. Uh, they're very common in schizophrenia, it's specifically a type of schizophrenia known as paranoid schizophrenia. The final type of delusions that I'll tell you about, the final major type of delusions, is what we call delusions of uh, reference, or delusions of perception, these can also be called. And these are where um, something happens Maybe a plane flies overhead, as planes do, especially if you're in a big city with lots of airports, there are planes flying overhead. And someone uh, with delusional thoughts can make a completely bizarre conclusion about this. Because the plane has flown overhead, they can conclude that Jesus is coming to the earth to save everyone again. They, they can make bizarre conclusions from seeing things. So um, from certain thing, normal things occurring in reality, they can make bizarre conclusions about that. Uh, and those are called delusions of reference. So they attribute a bizarre explanation to normal everyday things like a plane flying overhead and they come to some bizarre conclusion from that. And that's called a delusion of reference. So these are the two major categories of psychotic symptoms. As I say, they're major symptoms that play a part in the disorder schizophrenia, hallucinations and delusions. But people with um, bipolar disorder suffering from a manic episode can also get psychotic symptoms. And the psychotic symptoms are going to occur because of the volition is so high. So let me try and justify why psychotic symptoms can occur when volition is very high. So... Where do hallucinations come from? It's quite, it's easier to justify hallucinations than delusions. So we'll start with hallucinations. So where do hallucinations come from? The idea is that this comes from volition being too high and being applied to thoughts that should never have received volition. And this is the concept of aberrant salience. And actually this is also a concept that I probably should have or a big word, or a big term, that I should have probably mentioned when I was, um, when I was talking about disinhibition. So aberrant means wrong, salience means attaching importance to things, and this is really referring to the same 
idea that I've been telling you about here, promoting thoughts. So attaching salience to a thought is promoting that thought. So aberrant salience means aberrant promoting of thoughts. This is a very important term in the theory of schizophrenia and also the theory of manic episodes. So um, the idea is that when volition is so high, you can end up promoting up thoughts that should never have been promoted up. And this is why you can end up uh, becoming disinhibited, doing things that you would never have previously done. Uh, and it's also believed to be where the psychotic symptoms can come from. So the idea is that often portions of the brain practice. They have little practice thoughts that are tiny little thoughts and which would never have been promoted up and never brought to conscious attention previously. The idea is that only big thoughts will ever become conscious thoughts. So the idea is that certain bits of the brain will be processing thoughts that you are not consciously aware of, subconscious thoughts that are too small for you to be consciously aware of them. And these are little practice thoughts. So for instance, the visual cortex, which is right at the back of the brain here, the auditory cortex, which is in this sort of region of the brain, the somatosensory cortex, which is in this sort of region of the brain, these can have little practice thoughts, tiny little thoughts uh, that concern sensory stimuli that are not actually there, okay? They're practices, but they're not actually processing sensory information that should have been there. And this is not a problem in normal people because they're so small that we don't even notice them. They're far too small. They're all so small we don't even see them, to paraphrase a quote from Circe of Game of Thrones. So um, they're far too small for you to be consciously aware of them, and therefore you aren't consciously aware of them, and they don't cause you any problem at all. However, if you have far too high volition, you have aberrant salience, what can happen is these tiny little thoughts can now be promoted up to something much bigger, this picture here, and then you can become consciously aware of them. So these stupid little practice thoughts about sensory stimuli that are not really there, for instance, voices or, or uh, sorry, voices or things in the visual fields that aren't there or somatosensory stimuli that aren't there, they can now be promoted up to conscious attention and you think that they are real now. And that's the idea behind how you end up with these psychotic symptoms, that when volition is far too high, you end up promoting up thoughts that should never have been promoted up, and that's where the hallucinations come from. With regards to where delusions come from, it's believed to be potentially the same explanation, that again, thoughts, practice thoughts that should never have been promoted up are now being promoted up. And this is how you end up with these delusional beliefs. So all of this disinhibition and all the psychotic symptoms that can occur in manic episodes, these are believed to occur because of aberrant salience, applying volition, promoting up thoughts to thoughts that should never have been promoted up or that would never have been promoted up when you weren't in the manic episode. Now, I want to stress that not everyone suffering from a manic episode will go through all of these symptoms, that these are all symptoms that can occur in a manic episode. And I hope I've kind of justified for you what this concept of volition and aberrant salience and promoting up thoughts is, and how all of these symptoms here pertain to that. We will study this in a bit more detail when we come on to the monoamine hypothesis. We'll see the importance of dopamine here. Serotonin is important here. Noradrenaline is important here. Dopamine is important here, according to this very simple monoamine hypothesis, which is almost certainly far too simple. But it's a very nice theory nonetheless, and we'll study that uh, very soon. So, before we have a break then, let's go back to euphoric manic episodes. So as I say, these are the classical ones that people think of when they think of bipolar disorder. They think of people in manic episodes as being absolutely ecstatic, euphoric. However, in my experience of meeting people with bipolar disorder, as I've said previously, I've only met one person who suffered truly from euphoric manic episodes. All of the other people that I have met with bipolar disorder have been suffering from depressive manic episodes. So I think this is actually the more common type of episode, manic episode to have. And that's why I kind of feel that manic depression was a very good name for it, because it is still depression. Your mood is still low, and therefore we call it depression. But because your energy level and your volition is so high, you now are manically depressed. And as I say, people in a depressive manic episode, they 
are not happy, um, but they end up having a huge amount of energy, they can't sleep, they end up staying up all night and doing things, writing things on pieces of paper and things like that, um, and doing all sorts of things that they would have never previously done, and potentially having hallucinations and delusions as well, grandeur, usually. But other types of delusions can occur in a manic episode as well. And be aware that this actually makes um, manic episodes quite difficult to tell the difference between them sometimes and psychotic episodes. Because if you've got someone who's having hallucinations and delusions, of course, it can be difficult differentiating whether they're having a manic episode or whether they are having a psychotic episode of schizophrenia. And you have to sort of understand whether they have these other things like racing thoughts and pressured speech and flight of ideas and horrendously high energy. And if they have those, that points you in the direction of a manic episode. Whereas if they have the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which is basically the complete opposite of this, very low energy and not wanting to do much, um, uh, that points you more in the direction of a psychotic episode and potentially schizophrenia. So, uh, let's now discuss euphoric manic episodes then. So, it's exactly the same as all of this with regards to the energy going up and the volition going up. The only difference is that you have to change dysphoria to euphoria. So, cross out dysphoria and put euphoria. Euphoria means that you are incredibly happy. Your happiness goes up like this as well. So, if you're having a euphoric manic episode, both your happiness, your mood, and your energy, and your volition, all of those go through the roof in a euphoric manic episode. So, you're incredibly happy, you're incredibly energetic, and your volition, uh, your willpower, your ease of doing things is also through the roof. Now, again, uh, manic episodes can last from a few weeks to months to years. Uh, and people with bipolar disorder, they can have manic episodes, and then they can have a period of uh, normality again, and then they can have potentially a depressive episode, and then they can have a period of normality again, and then maybe another manic episode. So the fact that they can go both ways, they can have depressive episodes and manic episodes of these two different types, um, that's why we call it bipolar disorder, and why we call depression unipolar depression to stress the difference between it and bipolar disorder, but both of them are fundamentally considered disorders of mood. Okay, so I think we'll have a break here, and in the next video we'll have a look at the monoamine hypothesis of um, mood disorders.